Welcome to the uh, regular SAD meeting uh, of the 10th of August. Um, the first item on our agenda is the agenda review. Does anyone see any items they'd like to change or reorder or delete or that? None. Um, I comments from the public. Can I see one member of the public? Are there any comments from the public? No. Um, is there anyone online? Is there anyone online? Oh, there, I don't see anyone online, but I don't have my. There's, there's one person, but I don't see a hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, next item on our agenda is the general discussion of the process that we would like to um, amend if necessary for next year for the review the superintendent's review we've talked about amending it a number of years in a row and it would be great if we could come to a consensus and actually um, pull it into a more um, concise um, process this year we've talked about a contact of the lawyer at the at the uh, bsba and they they offer um, surveys and they offer assistance. I don't think we need that, having looked at what we do and listened to what uh, Sue Sigwowski said that they do for us. I don't think it's really worth the money, but it is worth, I think, our, um, getting our process in line. And so I'm going to turn that over to Lisa, the team the chair of that committee. Um, great. I will try to make this quick so that we have time to discuss if anybody has any discussion. Um, but the spec committee is myself and Kelly and Rick and Jonathan. And this year um, was my second year of being on it and every time we've sort of tweaked it. And so some of our recommendations for going forward include the following. Um, one, that the bulk, like basically the entire evaluation criteria will be Jay's goals for himself. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, Al. <laughs> and, you're done. Oh, and I, I wasn't going fast enough. <laughs> um, it's like the Hunger Games. <laughs> um, and so that would be instead of having the categories that we sort of make up and use every year, which are useful, but really just have it be based on the goals that he sets for himself that we approve. Um, the second part would be to, for the purposes of his evaluation, speak to the people who are his direct reports at the SAU office and then the school board members. Um, and that those two groups would be the people that we would talk to directly about his performance. Okay, so that means that we're sort of leaving out a group of people that we've been surveying the past couple of years. And so the idea was to have a community survey about the schools themselves rather than the superintendent in particular um, because what we found in surveying the community is most people are like, I don't have any interaction at all with Jay. He seems nice, um, which is not necessarily, I mean, it's lovely, but it's not necessarily productive. And so the thought was sometime in maybe March, we would do one survey, um, tech people, you're welcome out there, that would go to everyone instead of four separate surveys that always get confused. Um, and people, when they took the survey, could indicate whether they were a member of the public, whether they were a parent or a guardian, whether they were a teacher or staff member, um, or whether they were, what's the other group that we normally, I think that's it. So the three groups of people that we normally survey. And so one survey would go out in March, and it would be sort of more about how are things going in the schools that you have direct interactions with? And we would use those survey results if needed to inform Jay's performance review, which usually starts in May and June. So um, the example Kelly and I talked about was like, let's say in this community survey, it turns out that Jay uh, every Tuesday um, serves coffee to the entire Hanover community and nobody likes coffee, they prefer tea. Um, you know, and that came out and we felt that that was something that we needed to ask about in his review, coffee versus tea preferences, we would add that to his performance review. But other than that, it would just be something that would be shared with the principals and with Jay as to how people felt the schools were doing. Um, and so that is really where we are. Um, the other part is every year we try to make 
Jay's review shorter and shorter and pithier um, so that it's not a 25 page document that he has to read through. So I think we went from 25 pages to 15 pages to seven pages. So we're getting there. Um, but the idea is to keep the review short and concise um, with maybe two or three quotes to back up every one of the points that we make instead of we tend to do 10 to 15. So we're just trying to make it a, a little bit shorter and a little less, less to read, more to act on, I think is our, is our goal. And so just wondered if anyone else had any feedback based on the process of the past couple of years, including Jay. Um, and then I think that's it. So we had just said that we would talk about it at this meeting so that we can make changes so that next May we're not being like, oh, we're just gonna do it the same way again because we haven't had time to change anything. I was just gonna say, um, I, I like that idea. I think it would be really important for the board and me to establish the goals up front. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think it'd be really kind of cool if we did that survey and somehow we're able to structure the survey so we get some feedback on those goals um, in whatever themes we choose or the questions that we pick. That'd be helpful for me like, using it as a professional development tool. Okay. So my only, I, I like, I think it's important that the uh, superintendent evaluation process focus on people who have direct interaction with the superintendent. I, I absolutely agree with that. I guess my question on the community survey, well, I think we need to do a community climate survey, school climate survey, et cetera. I guess I'm confused about whether we need to do that with the superintendent process at all. I mean, I think we do. Right, I think we do a school climate survey already for parents. Um, and I think less is more in terms of surveys. So I just, I don't know that it, to me, I don't know that we need that piece of the puzzle to be able to do the superintendent evaluation. Okay. Well, then a question- Unless we're required. Yeah, a question that I would have is, that would mean that the teachers would not have any direct input into Jay's evaluation. Um, and how do we feel about that? So, yeah. I've always had a problem with employees critiquing their their bosses. So I've always thought it very weird that we have people who have access to grind possibly participating. So I think it's direct reports, school board who we supervise Jay and and then I you know I know the race school does their annual parent survey that Lauren briefs out like in. May or April, so I don't know if the high school does something similar. I'm sure they do. So, but I, I've always had a concern about staff and faculty creating their boss. So then, the, that leads me to to suggest, and I agree with you. Um, Kim also had a point too. So I'm sorry, Kim. No, it's okay. We just complete that thought, and then um, we we also have traditionally surveyed the SAU office who are. Um, under Jay, and they right. would be reporting directly to Jay. So well, that's a direct direct report. I, I I don't have an issue with. Okay, go ahead, Kim. That's I just wanted to get that out. Um. So I yeah I, I do I take a little bit of an opposite view on Rick on this one. I mean I I'm just curious if at no point throughout the year there isn't a staff climate survey. Um. I think that that would be helpful information, and it doesn't necessarily have to go to the level of detail that we would ask a direct report. But if we're not doing that, then I, and it's not part, you know, the parent survey, right? I, I hear that. Um, I would be in favor of doing some sort of staff climate survey. Isn't there already mechanisms in place? So if someone has an issue or a concern, there's plenty of ways for that to be brought to the administration and or the school board. So I don't know. Would that be anonymous? Well, it could be anonymous. Uh, they could also put their names there. I just don't know. I I believe our school districts are very well versed in letting people know if they have a concern or an issue or they're happy. So I, I just generally I agree with Kim's comments and I think there should be more to that point. Yes, Kelly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
I'm wondering if that could be achieved via the principles, if the principles <clears throat> could somehow be, I guess, gather that information, summarize that information and share that as part of their responses to the superintendent evaluation. Yeah. I, I really like the idea of a, a school climate inventory. There are some very well documented, well validated um, school climate inventories that have a section on leadership. Yeah. And that and I would that we could we could kill two multiple birds with a single stone in in that the same sort of thing applies when I do the principal surveys every year. There's always I can always pretty much just from the open-ended questions, I can see what percentage of people are giving the the um, disagree and strongly disagrees. And there's always a small number of those folks at each school who are using that opportunity to voice their their uh, anonymous uh, raspberries toward the the leader, and then everybody else gives their glowing. Uh, comments if we did a validated and reliable school climate inventory i'm trying to think i think it was the university of kentucky has a good one um but uh something like that could could achieve both purposes they could make comments on district administration and they can make comments on school administration but it wouldn't be quite as personal and mm -hmm. what i find myself having to do is to share that information with the principals without I, I like to spare them the angst of having to read some mean pot shot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll typically summarize it um, mm -hmm. because I, I, I did just go over all of them with them uh, up until this past year. And I, I just, uh, it's just not, I don't think productive to have some of that just sort of bitter, uh, often groundless uh, stuff that comes out. And especially when when people people who are at different levels in the organization have their perspective on leadership, which in itself probably is it has a a useful uh, application, but often is is just not well informed. Um, oh, I was just gonna say I'm absolutely in favor of doing school climate surveys at all of the schools. I just I don't think that that needs to necessarily, it can certainly inform our summary of the superintendent's evaluation, but I don't think that it needs to be tied to it time-wise necessarily or in name, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll, I'll piggyback off of Kelly's last comment. I think for me, the school, the results of any sort of school climate survey are important to the superintendent's evaluation if the board in, in collaboration with the superintendent set a goal for the superintendent such that school climate was an important thing to achieve, right? Or to get better at. And so I think where the whole process sort of falls into place for me is A, making sure that the board and the superintendent have set the appropriate goals and then B, that we um, then elaborate on what the measurements are going to be for each of those goals that then that informs how, how do we determine whether or not he's done well in those areas and that could be through a survey that could be through conversations with the people that are involved in that and so just making sure that this whole process is is tied together in such a way that it makes sense and that we just don't do a school climate survey and then take the results and realize that you know maybe jay was doing um, not well in a particular area, but it wasn't an area that we were particularly concerned with to start with, right? And suddenly it generates an issue that didn't previously exist. And I just want to be careful that we don't, that if we're going to ask for input, that the input is directly related to the items that we thought Jay really needed to work on. And my response to that might be that if we were to do a climate survey and feel a need for a climate survey, then it should not be connected to Jay's review whatsoever, unless Jay's review includes a goal that specifies something about school climate. That he's correct. Did I state that right? All right. And, and to the extent that I mean, have uh, um, and pardon my ignorance on this one for for having to know that. Have we finalized the goals for this no, upcoming year? At what point we do do that? Okay. So I think then you know, in order to make this all sort of fit together like a puzzle, right? Then I think our the, the board's first step might ought to be finalizing those goals with the foresight, right? That however we evaluate those goals at the end of the year, they all need to sort of make sense. Absolutely. 
Yeah, sort of did in, in your this year's evaluation you gave yeah. me my marching orders essentially so yeah. i feel like i feel like i've got my goals um but and that is different from what we're talking about that we have done in the past where right. we discussed it together and everyone yeah. agrees as well as you that this is what you would like to be working on and we expect that you sure. will work on for the next year and maybe that's a starting point yeah. maybe that like those those marching orders are the place to start the discussion to make sure we're all in agreement that that's what we would be evaluating you on okay i assume so. that you'd already discussed those when in your we yeah. <laughs> so. did yeah so what we might do is put that topic discussing board goals for next year on the October meeting. Folks, does that make sense for the October SAU meeting? Using the document that's already in place as a starting point. Right. And then see if we define to add or, or delete anything. Does that sound like a viable agenda item to address what we're talking about? I do think that we settled on those goals. And Jay, yeah. we're already into the season. Jay started his planning. So I'd, I'd be more comfortable sticking with the goals and then maybe just a discussion between the board, the committee members, and Jay if there's a need to fine tune anything, but not to stray from what we've already agreed was in the uh, resorting that. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Neil. Um, I would agree with what Tom said. And I think if there's any action left to be done, it might be just reviewing those goals and making sure that we've defined the adequate measures right. by which we're going right. to determine whether or not they've been met, because then that can directly feed into how we're going to actually perform the evaluation. Yep. Um, and I, I would also echo, um, I wouldn't want to change things now. And typically the timing for setting these comes earlier in the year, not in October. Right. So I would still argue with, let's keep things the way they are. And maybe just do a little bit of additional Add some work measurements on, de on defining um, I think the that's measurements. What I was implying, of course, but not specifying. And Kim, you had a question too. I was actually almost about to say the exact same thing as Neil, <laughs> um, but also uh, that you know, I think when I brought up the point of having a, a staff climate survey is just because I think that that's the only place my ignorance, but I think that was the only place that it was happening district wide before, and. Um, you know, I want to support the idea of continuing to have staff have an outlet in a survey form like parents do that we give them the opportunity. So um, it doesn't have to be within the spec process. I just would support that. Yeah. Any other points on this? Wouldn't you be able to get that through like the teachers? Isn't that a major source for getting feedback? I'm just wondering if we could like collaborate with the union as we have in the past, right? Like, to it seems like an, or, an organic place for our teachers to voice. I mean, potentially. I mean, not all staff are unionized, right? Not but, all staff, right? Uh, we we're we were talking about teachers specifically, right? I'm talking about every every, every staff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. As, as I say, all this this is great. I think we can use the existing goals that you gave me to create the outline, the framework for what the process will be. And the way we're moving uh, with our um, teacher supervision model is, is toward an evidence-based, um, we have a framework, it's called the Danielson framework. And, and in, those, in those evaluations, we're looking for sources of evidence to see if people met, made those goals. I think that's the, on the next conversation. I think that a couple of you mentioned it, that we would, I think we would meet together to yeah. figure out, okay, what, what sources of evidence will I be able to bring to the table to show you that we've attained or we've progressed on each of these different goals. Okay, so to summarize, <laughs> my marching orders are to work with you and the committee to look at those goals and find measurements, and then we'll bring them, you know, we'll just do an update in the October meeting about what we decided and see if there's any issues from there. And then we in this way we may be skipping the teacher input and the staff input of you know process so perhaps someone not the spec committee but someone would do a school climate survey that would include all the various schools and all the various constituencies together to get some information about how things are going that would not necessarily inform or not inform the superintendent's review but might be useful to you going forward sure. Okay. It sounds good. I may just change the language on it a little bit to say that um, I think where the committee is of value, right, is to to talk through these things and 
to come back to the board with suggestions yeah. on how we do these things. Yeah. And then they have the board agree rather than for the committee to decide this is how we're going to do it. It's just a slight, I, and I, oh, maybe it was language that you didn't mean to use or or I misinterpreted. But I heard it, it was but, the way that Neil was asking for it. Yeah, I, I what I was that. saying is that we okay. would we would come up with something and then present it in October for yeah. you all to say yeah. yay or nay, or you forgot something, or that's ridiculous. And then the only piece <laughs> that I might add to it is to the extent that we want to actually codify this process moving forward, you might want to develop some policy or small p policy or regulation around this so that future boards then if we find this to be successful know that there is um, a, a framework by which we handle this going forward so that when everybody here is gone the process doesn't change that much or is forgotten okay hi ben and then not to derail us, but um, at one of the last meetings, um, we did talk in terms of the evaluation about sharing of the raw data from the surveys, which we're, now that we're not surveying, it feels as if we don't need to have that discussion. Would that be correct? Well, we'd still have the direct reports, right? Yeah, but the direct reports we might be able to interview. I mean, when we interview the principals, there aren't that many direct reports. So it might just be that we have a focus group with the direct reports, or I, I don't know. That That's a good question. So, but it just doesn't, there aren't, it's not like it would be 400 like it has been in the past. It would be 10 or so. So, um, but I just, I, I didn't want to skip over that piece of it. So. But for now, we'll just say we're good unless we decide to do an extensive survey and then we'll talk about data sharing if that happens. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, to that point, sorry, Ben, but I don't know what our policy is on this, but I know that in, in the past year or so, the members of the public have asked for results of surveys that have been done. So we probably want to make sure that our policy is clear on that climate survey how those results will be shared, um, at what point, you know, what level that we shared aggregate data, et cetera. Yeah, I and mean, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about policy offhand, but I think historically we've shown annual yeah. results on PowerPoint. Right, right, yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Any other points? On that topic? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, the next uh, topic that um, was suggested for tonight is the uh, reviving the administrator's salary committee. I don't know exactly what that involves, but I, I do think we've discussed this many times, and I don't know why it was temporarily dissolved, but it sounds like we do need to consider um, reviewing the administrator's salary if possible. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. And it's so, one, of your, one of the goals that you put down on my. But we had tabled that committee for a while, and I don't know why. So that, that was COVID. <laughs> we she answered for everything. <laughs> uh, so, if there are um, any board members who might think they'd like to serve on that committee, I will um, open my email to um, any any uh, suggestions or any volunteers. How many people are you looking for? Well, maybe before we jump right into that, so a couple of ideas here. Right, one is. Um, so if you make it a committee of the board, right, it has to adhere to all of the open meeting laws and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that any folks that are participating in this committee understands that that's the ground rules for that. Alternatively, if the board were so to decide this, right, you could simply task the superintendent to look into this issue and then bring back the recommendations to the board. If you do it that way, then uh, we don't, well, we don't then have board member participation in that effort the final decision can still come back to the board for deliberation and decision here. So two different ways to handle the same topic. I, I personally would like to second the latter plan, um, partly because I think some of the groundwork has already been done on this. And I know Jay has access to that. Um, I also, I guess, you know, the last year or so has really shown me the extent to which we need to look at this, we need to look at it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've been hearing that from members of the public too. It's really overall a drop in the bucket in our overall budget um, to, to try to make our salaries more competitive um, on, a, on a per diem basis. And so 
that that would be in the interest of expediency. Um, that would that would also be my recommendation. Any other responses? Mm -hmm. So is a new board, um, how is it typically done? And maybe this is an answer for Jay or people that have, have been on the board for longer, but how, what is the kind of collection compensation analysis process? I mean, is there a professional firm that does it? Do we just go look at other school districts and pull public records? Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> sure, so the last time this was done in a more formal uh, method, we had a member of the board great deal of financial expertise who worked with Jamie and Amy to, to do a sort of a, a comparable study. Um, now, since then, the DOEs are putting out the salary, doing like names, everything for all administrators. I have a copy of the spreadsheet. I, I hope to pin to board docs, but I can't get it off out of Excel for some reason. I'll do it and post it for you. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I amended it to because there were a couple missing, but um, looking at the spreadsheet, the reason this is becoming more and more of an issue is because as statewide teacher salaries increase by step and by track movement and by raises, um, we've been steadily providing either a 2% or this year a 1.5% administrative raise with no steps, no other adjustments. And so we're seeing the gap between the per diem rate for teachers and administrators widening. Um, and that uh, might not be a, a fair or a a financially prudent way to, to analyze the situation, but from a, um, the perspective of an administrator uh, who, who would have had his or her most difficult year of their career to see their a, a little increment of a little incremental growth in their salary this year, even compared to previous years, while the teaching staff goes up another step and sees another two percent raise, uh, it just doesn't feel feel right. Um, and where we're going relative to other districts in the state, with, with Jim gone, Jim, we paid Jim roughly what he was making in Keene, which was a, a higher salary than, almost higher than what um, Mr. Campbell had been making. But if we take that one out and I look at the salaries from last year of about 300, 300 or so administrators that are full time, our first, uh, our highest paid Administrator would be number one, would be at um, ranked at like 112. We have to go 112 administrators deep to get to, to that salary from highest salary to lowest. So, uh, and then everything's below that. I mean, our, our lowest paid assistant um, is, is, is down. I'm, I'm going to extend this analysis to include assistant principals as well, but we're, we're not among the highest paying. And when people are looking, looking at job openings, it is that's yeah. the other thing that's a pressure on us that makes this more urgent is that there's a, it's a shortage of administrators and, and people are scrambling and people are, try, are trying to make the best decisions they can for themselves. And, and sometimes that allure of a higher salary overcomes any loyalty people have to the organization. And you can't blame people for doing what's best for their own and their family's interest. Well, I think, did that answer your question, Garrett, or not at all? Oh, yeah. Yes. It mm -hmm. So it sounds like we have, oh, any other questions? No. Um, so I, I, I think what would be helpful is to think of this also not as salary, but as compensation. Mm -hmm. So we want to think about, um, you know, kind of, I, I don't, and I don't know how much of this is, is able to be accessed, but for, you know, our health plans and, you know, retirement and, and whatnot. So I think that that should be broadened because it's not all just salary. Um, and then second, um, you know, I, I'm wondering if we should think about what the time frame is to have, if we're leaning toward Jay coming back to us with some analysis for us to deliberate, um, what the time frame is thinking that this does relate pretty strongly to our I would imagine negotiations, um, you know, for, for teachers as we're talking about, you know, kind of step tracking, which would be under discussion. So I'm wondering if we can agree on a time frame, maybe a meeting so that they can come back with to discuss. Okay. So. I would love that. I, I would, in fact, I really feel like it needs to be something that we, we do in conjunction with this year's budget process, which means it's, it's a pretty um, compact timeline. Which to me argues for Neil's second suggestion because I think that's faster. 
I, I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm, I'm looking at Jamie with the benefit of my distance glasses, but I'm, I'm wondering, is that something that you think is doable, Jamie? We've done a lot of pre-work already, but I mean, I'm happy to, to do a ton of, of, as much of the research as I can handle. And like I said, a lot of the data is available. Yeah, the data is available on both sides. I have them for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I think that to me, there's 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 two pieces to this, right? I think that there's some work that could be done in the short term, um, specifically related to sort of where we stand now in comparison to other districts, you know, in, in our area or where the pool of candidates might be coming from that we're looking to attract. Um, and I think that that could probably be done fairly quickly given the data that we already have. But to Jamie's, and I'm gonna. Put words in her mouth or the sense of hesitancy right on this is that i think that there's a bigger aspect to this um, that might take a little bit more work um, that could continue beyond that initial effort because i think it does relate to exactly what kim pointed out to is it relates to our current our, our contract negotiations um, and there's some hard decisions i think that the board is going to need to wrestle with right because um our, our general approach historically to negotiations has resulted in a certain level of increases that you can find yourself having to keep pace with on the administrative side. And that always hasn't worked out quite well. And so if we want to take the long view of this, I think the board needs to consider the types of stuff that we're going to consider in negotiations, the positions that we want to adopt there in order to be able to get the outcomes that we're hoping to get. Okay. Sorry. I, I agree with that. I guess the only thing I would add is the, the first piece of it. I think we need to look at a comparative study, but I don't think that we can do that in the in a vacuum. I think we have to look at also a comparative study of our teachers. And I suspect what we're going to find is that our teachers are among the highest paid in the state and our administrators are nowhere near that. And that is, I mean, I think that's the gap that we're finding. And there's a whole host of historical reasons for that, experience reasons. I mean, we have also a very experienced teaching staff, right? Um, and, and so I think there's a lot of factors going into that, but at the end of the day, it means that we have many teachers in the district making more than our administrators on a per diem basis, right? And I think we've been lucky in the past few hires to find wonderful people who had connections to this area and wanted to be here and, and it didn't push us to make some of those tough decisions. And I think now that we're looking at the principal position at the high school, we're seeing that, that you know, we're not finding that person who's, you know, the, the administrator that our community is, um, or we haven't been able to find the person that our community expects for the salary that we're able to offer um, with a whole host of other factors, pandemic and whatnot going on, obviously. But I think we're at sort of a, a critical moment. And I guess I'm also a little nervous about waiting too long to make this so make this decision. So um, while I think there is sort of there are some immediate steps that can be taken, there's some long term study to be done. I also think there is some urgency. And so I don't want the long term piece of it to be too long term because I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot by doing that. All right, and last question. So who, when we're deciding to hire, say a new principal or that type of thing, who, is it Jay, is this superintendent that comes up with salary recommendations or is it us? Because at the end of the day, I think it sounds like too, also based on what I'm hearing is, is that there probably are gonna be some decisions made that are, okay, who are key administrators that are, all administrators are, is important, but the really important ones that are the leaders of the, you know, the principals. And, that type of thing versus maybe other administrators, right? And whether those folks need to either as new hires or just as some of the step increases start to get back in line with something more competitive because they're, they're critical. So it's Jay that makes those recommendations. Right, and I don't make them solo. I always consult with Jamie yeah. um, and and, uh, and the board obviously ultimately approves the, the, the whatever the, the um, salary package is. Um, and to the, to the point of benefits, one of the things that Jamie and I started working on, I think when I first got here, was starting to think about what, what options could we have where we figure out what is the cost of our benefits package now? And could we just use that standard cost, but create options within it that might make it more attractive and customizable for, for our leadership um, that wouldn't necessarily cost us more, 
but might be more attractive to them. Like a younger administrator might be more interested in vacation time than than 403B matches and those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, that's definitely a big piece of it that we've put together. Okay. So two things to keep in mind as we work into this. Uh, one is that your administrators are non-union. Okay, so you don't have the same time constraint that you have that you're going to be facing with your teachers union and support staff union in New Hampshire, there are deadlines by which time those um, agreement terms have to, you know, come, come to pass or, or you don't put a warrant on, right? Uh, they can petition around you, but it's a whole nother situation. Um, so you have a deadline with your support staff and your teachers union that you don't have with your non-union. And I just wanna make that point because it is kind of tied, um, but you don't have the same, you know, pressure, I think. When is that deadline? It's, uh, Kim, it's usually by the third, it's the third week in January. It has to be on, a, you have to come to an agreement so it can be placed on the warrant. Yeah, for New Hampshire. So I, I think the warrants are due the third week of January. Third Thursday. It's 20, 20 days prior to when we have to do another warning. So the dates are all tied together, but it usually falls about third week of January, about the 20th. So I'm hearing that there were two options. Oh, can you have another question? Oh, so well, and it's it's more of a question for Jay and Jamie. I mean when would this review data as much as you can get done so that the board has something to sink its teeth into, um, at least the first crack at it, be able to be produced? Is it our next SAU meeting? Is it three SAU meetings or not? I mean, just kind of, I would, is it before January or yeah. not? I guess yes. is my question. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it's not just me doing it. We have an HR person who would be involved heavily in gathering the data. Um, New Hampshire gathers a lot of it. I don't know about the principal side. They, they usually run a year behind on their principal data. Um, you know, superintendent, assistant superintendent, BA data is very rarely available in New Hampshire to post it every year. Um, Vermont does it as well. Principals, I think they're, they're probably doing it more readily now. Um, so, so yeah, the part of it that skews it, you know, like you pointed out, which is also what took so much time the last time we did this, was that, you know, we picked the top 20 um, school districts who were comparable to Hanover, right, in expectation, in, you know, teaching salaries in size somewhat, and we asked for their human resource departments to send us what the benefit packages were. Because while you look at the per diem rate, that's one part of it, right? Um, you know, I know our benefits packages here are very, very rich. They are, I can tell you that, I've researched that. <laughs> so when you look at a total compensation package, uh, that's what we want to be able to look at. We want to ask, you know, at the other school districts, you know, how long has the principal been there that makes $158,000? You know, has he been there 30 years? Does he have, you know, what other benefits does he have? You know, how many days does he work? So that's what takes a little bit more time. The raw data of just the dollar amount of the numbers is quick and easy. Um, and, and so I would then want to say to Jay um, and, and you, Jamie, would would it, your portion of this review to get to something where you could actually weave changes into the, this current budget, is there time to do that? Because obviously coming back from the October 26th meeting isn't going to work. Is that our next essay? And so it, that's sounds like that's where we are. And well, I, question. I mean, I think we need to make it work, right? Because yeah. that's when the SAE budget needs to be looked at and ratified. And I don't think you can, you know, there are so many administrators sitting within that budget alone that we can't ratify an SAE budget and then go back and change it because right. it's solely supported by the school districts. So and my and that's our goal. It would be next year if we didn't do it now. And I'm, I'm just asking if we could um, 
concretize where we are right now right. and say to the two of you who it sounds like unless folks don't agree um that would be placed on your task list to be done and woven in by that um, we can get matter. all of that data i yeah. don't know that yeah. we would be in a place to be able to make well thought out solid recommendations on how to change the whole entire package we can try I would suggest, yeah, that we, we give you a status update and whatever data we do have and yeah. whatever progress we're able to make. Again, we make that pro progress toward that goal. But just, just to rattle off a few, and, and again, we're only looking at salary numbers here and we don't know all the variables. But it used to be that we had this select group of similar types of communities that we compared ourselves with. And, and now I'm looking at uh, Hinsdale, Seabrook, Wyndham. Uh, Hopkinton, Merrimack Valley, Milford, New Boston, Derry, Hooksit, Fall Mountain, uh, Manchester, Laconia, Wyndham, uh, John Stark, Portsmouth, obviously, Rye, Derry, Litchfield. I mean, there's it, it's a much broader bunch of towns now that are paying their principals more. Um, and it, it's, it's no big surprise. Some of some of these, just like Jamie said, you look at some of these, some of these are unionized. They have administrator unions, and um, and those would have scheduled salary increases, and, and they would, you know, sometimes those those could be two, three percent a year. Um, so we have two things happening: we have a we have a we have a separation between teacher salary growth and administrator salary growth, and then we have the the comparatives. What's happening in other systems um, that all conspire to to make us either attractive or not that attractive. Oh, one other um, sort of non-quantifiable piece that would be really helpful to me would be to understand what our current wonderful administrators would like to see. I mean, I think that that would be important to me also to understand. Um, you know, we we know that we we lost an administrator to teaching partly yeah. because of this, right? We lost another administrator to something else partly because of this, and. You know, we need to avoid that happening, and I, I guess I want to understand what what they would like to see as well. I would say anecdotally, I mean, probably the thing we hear most commonly is is that that concern about the fact that when they're looking at when they're looking at what their their annual raise is, for example, and they see, um, I mean, they can do math and they figure out what the, the hourly uh, difference is, and they and they look at what their responsibility is, and and again. This this year made it stand out a little more just because of the high stakes um, work that they were involved in, um, all, all the regular duties plus managing their schools through a pandemic and all the additional communication. Um, I think that's got a lot of folks looking at it, and that was the big thing they said when when they saw uh, their increase relative to the increase in teacher their their own teachers received. It it just just didn't feel right, and they get it. They we started the year really unsure of our cash flow. We really had no idea of how the federal funds were going to flow, and 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 so everybody knew that, and I think everybody was more than okay with it. We wanted to make this all work, but but then when reality hits and you have a little time to reflect, that's where we're hearing the the biggest concern that there seems to be an unfairness in salary growth among the people they lead and, and their own group. Mm -hmm. So so in the interest of time, are we content to do we accept putting this in Jay and Jamie's hands? To be, yeah, Gary. Well, since if we're making this is it possible, Jamie and others, to do this, you know, not you don't have to have everything, but you kind of have it almost a living at least in my business, we kind of are constantly collecting salary and bonus and all that kind of data. And every year, you know, but we always said what we just had left. So it's not like all of a sudden we do it like every five years, but you kind of have a living, breathing comp data. So maybe it's calling four schools, right? It's not all of a sudden doing all 30 schools and getting everything all done. And then we're kind of like, okay, we're done for the next five years because you know, maybe you add a few more schools into it, or we focus on just the principals or just people that we're really focused on hiring now. Leave the rest of the administrative analysis, administrator comp analysis to the side. Take it chunks, right? And I'm guessing that's what Jay and Jane would be able to exactly. Do together I'm trying to kind of make it a smaller start. task a little bit yeah. in the day. Yeah, with everything going on. 
Does that sound agreeable to everyone? And more who we're mostly concerned about, I think, right now, like if we're, you know, obviously we're for hiring a principal here, I think we need, I would want it. We should have the absolute best data so we can make sure when we pull the trigger on a principal here, that, you know, when and if that time comes, hopefully that we are, have the best data available. Absolutely. That's just one position, so. Any other comments? <clears throat> And we move on to the next item, budget guidelines. Budget committee meeting will have something to say about this, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so actually, the uh, none of the budget committees um, have met yet, <laughs> but um, I think that um, you know, I think maybe in a change of pace or see if this goes anywhere. Um, we, we will be meeting as a budget committee um, on August 17th. Both Dresden and Hanover will be meeting, and I believe Norwich is meeting sometime after right on, that. Yeah. Um, and, um, but instead of surveying those um, couple of members who are on the budget committee then um, to create the draft guidelines for then the full board, um, if anybody has any um, uh, either economic issues that they like to bring up, kind of best practices from last year, um, uh, kind of what did you like, what did you think could be improved, just it's kind of easier to do it now than after we write the one to two page budget guidelines and think of what the cap would be um, for next year, um, you know, kind of I just wanted to give a little bit of space here um, to, to have those discussions if anybody has anything that they had off top of mind. Um, we can incorporate them as, as we meet as a group um, on the 17th. Um, I would also say that, that, you know, as we all know, this is a negotiations year. So um, thinking about what is our, traditionally we do a budget kind of cap, right? We say do not exceed 3% or whatever it is, increase over the previous year. Um, a lot of our budget is salaries, right? For our, in our union contracts that we'll be negotiating. So we're gonna have to think as a budget committee, kind of how do we create those kind of guidelines that are flexible enough to accommodate the negotiations track, which the budget committee really doesn't have purview over um, specifically. So um, just wanted to give a little space right now for that and just to kind of give you an update on the kind of what are we anticipating um, going forward. So does anyone have something to add, Tom? So I think I'm on the SA budget committee. And, <laughs> and uh, so and I think it's also structured based on the current schedule that we will meet uh, to establish these guidelines actually after all the others others have gone first, which is good because all the others tend to drive this. But then the challenge is that this is the first one that we approve before all the others have been discussed. So that's one thing. I We never seem to be able to figure out the best way to mesh that. And in the end, we sometimes have to go back and readjust the SEU. And I, I just think maybe even the three of us or four of us, Jay, and as a budget committee could think through, I don't know if we need to come up with a slightly different schedule as far as how to approve the SAU budget so that we're not always thinking we may have to reopen it after we've gone through the Norwich, Dresden, and Hanover budgets and realize that we need to adjust things after we've already approved them. So that's without even thinking through the um, guidelines themselves, just process wise, I think that might be something we also want to discuss at our first uh, meeting there. I don't there. think there's any other way to do it. Yeah, I don't either. It's just, it seems like we keep running the same issue and there doesn't seem to be one. But, so it's, it may just be a matter of being flexible. But as it's we not hard. To, I mean, we've done mm -hmm. it. We've yes. reopened it. Yep. Especially this administrative. <laughs> the compensation exactly. group has get picked off. I totally see it. Is there anyone else? Or would anyone else like to weigh in on the guidelines? I don't know if it's so much on the guidelines, but I really appreciated the process that we used where we, we tasked the principals with setting their own priorities and we avoided the nitpicking of are you sure you need this thing? Are you sure you really want the risers carpeted? Right. And we trusted them to make those decisions. And I thought that was a much much healthier process for all of us. Any other comments? No, well, then we'll move on. Um, we have the uh, approval of expenditures. Do we need to discuss that one? Or do we just think we want to? Yes, we're good? Yep. Okay. okay. Does that mean you have a question? No, I want to move to approve. I, I, I do have to ask um, if we can, we can we just pull out the July 21st minutes because I was not here. I'd have to abstain from July 21st. So no, you, just don't, pull you don't have to abstain from, 
Do you want to abstain on the no, next minutes, agenda? According to Robert's rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. <clears throat> to clarify, you don't. If you weren't there for a meeting, you don't need to abstain from voting on the minutes. So your vote on the minutes is just a reflection that you believe that they accurately represent what happened at the meeting. Even if you weren't there, it's still okay if you I'm voted sure in favor. It's or accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about you all from my vacation. <laughs> Do I need to pull out the approval of expenditures as a separate item, or can that be lumped in with the uh, okay. consent? Yeah. May I have a motion on the consent agenda? Yeah. Move to approve items B, C, D, E, and F by consent. Seconded by Lisa. All those in favor? Mm, unanimous. Thank you. That's quick. Um, the next item on the agenda is the report of chair. I have nothing special to report. <laughs> if anyone has any issues at all they'd like to talk about on their October 26th meeting, please let me know. Um, committee reports. We have heard from the SPEC committee. And I suspect there will be um, at least one other committee to report out. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> so the uh, the SAU Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee has now met twice. Um, uh, both of those meetings focused primarily on hearing from the previous group and the work and the efforts that have been done to date. Um, we haven't quite gotten through all of that information yet, so uh, we will pick that up. Um, in, in our third meeting that has yet to be scheduled. At the second meeting, we also began a little bit of work on trying to have the committee develop their definition of, uh, of um, equity. Um, and I think that that's gonna go a long way in helping establish a baseline for everybody on the committee to work from as we move forward with some of the other things since a lot of this is gonna be based around um, equity. Um, we're in the process right now of trying to nail down a standing meeting time for this group. And given all of the other meetings that we've got going on, plus the large size of the committee, we're about 20. Um, it's been a little challenging. So I've just recently sent out another doodle poll uh, asking for folks availability around two other um, recurring dates. And so I'll give it another day or two to see what the results of that are. And hopefully we'll be able to establish a standing meeting time that we'll be able to get together every month. Thank you. I would just like to express my extreme gratitude for your stepping up to the plate and taking that committee over. It's really been a godsend for the board at large because you are so well versed in all of the procedures and the right to know and open meeting laws. I think you've also helped the 19 other members to understand what their job is. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Um, we would like to hear next from the assistant superintendent, Robin. Hello, everyone. We met today for our um, pandemic response committee. We changed the name now, move away from the COVID 19 committee. Um, but we basically looked at the decisions that we made at our last meeting and looked at the new guidance that came out yesterday from Vermont, and it's really in line with what we'd already previously decided. They recommended 10 days with masks in school and then an 80% vaccination rate, and again, following the guidelines that we've been following. So it matches perfectly what we're doing. We moved our, we talked originally about having vaccination rates of 70% to go along with you know, looking at the other data and the state and surrounding us and the towns around us and area. So we decided to just make that consistent though and move to 80% overall for the district for vaccination rates. Now, given that we do know that Hanover has implemented a mask mandate and we'll continue to follow that. Um, so I don't see us changing dramatically in the next few weeks once we begin school, but we'll see what happens. And as of yet, there's still no vaccine for children younger than 12. So that again is going to, you know, take us quite a significant amount of time, I feel like, to get to any kind of 80% vaccination rate, especially at our elementary schools. But we've made decisions about each of the, you know, really pertinent pieces like the boxes. We know that everyone, students and staff have to be masked on buses. Um, I did include the, I did a little pandemic framework to try to just 
I have kind of some bullets on each of the major topic areas that I did include that in the packet. And I revised the opening, reopening guidelines that were done last year. I just simplified it. I took out a lot of the information that was in there that was no longer pertinent or not pertinent at this point. So I've included those in the packet, but I'm happy to answer any questions. That's really the big thing that's changed. We talked about field trips, um, things like, you know, allowing for walking field trips at this point and allowing for field trips in the two states, Vermont, New Hampshire, at the principal's discretion. So we're giving the principals, I feel like, more discretion too for big events in the schools and determining whether, you know, those would be appropriate. We talked about staff meetings being in person this year. And again, um, you know, wearing masks and trying to maintain social distances and things like that. So we've gone through all of that, I feel like the major, major areas of concern. Sports will continue with, we will not a lot have masks outside. So we'll continue to allow for um, sports to be played maskless, except for volleyball, which will be indoors. We are allowing spectators following the guidelines that we've set in place. We're allowing visitors and volunteers in the schools as long as they prearrange and um, again are following the guidelines. So I think that is basically all the big, big topics that we've covered. But I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great. So the opening plan is this going to be shared with the public? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to share it with all of you first and then we'll put it on our website. And yeah, so like that's some of the major points. there's some like typos. I, I assume this is just a draft right yes. now. But the travel restriction about international travel is, is confusing. Mm -hmm. Um because it talks about international travel other than Canada or cruise ships. Requires self-quarantine for 10 days unless a negative PCR test is administered on day six or seven. One may return on day eight for those who have not been vaccinated. Okay. That yeah, I know. I thought that was confusing too. Okay. I'll work on, I'll work on that piece too. It's that, that part of it is confusing because it's different requirements for vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I think, yeah, maybe just break it out. Say yeah. if you're vaccinated, okay. this is your restrictions. If you're unvaccinated, this is your restrictions. Any other questions for all? Yeah. Can I follow up on the travel one too? Because mm -hmm. so domestic travel does not require quarantine. Is that for non-vaccinated people too? Right. So someone could go to Florida that's unvaccinated to come back and right. really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no that's some for quarantine. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um second domestic like yeah. Um, and that's been in place actually since the last school yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, my second question was about the uh, uh, volunteers, uh, people coming into the building as volunteers. How are we going to have them show that they've been vaccinated? No, we are not going. We are going to ask questions about vaccination status, but we're not going to ask for proof of vaccination status. And do we get to approve of this? Uh, Back to school plan because I'm not. Is that that's going to be the case even in the elementary schools? Well, you know, I've gotten different information from our attorneys. You know, I sent some yeah. information to you today, and it's hard for us to. I think it's hard for people in the front offices to monitor that. You know, we can ask people, and we would still obviously have people follow all of the protocols that we have in place, masking, you know, social distancing and having an appointment before mm -hmm. coming into the building, but that's a tough one too. Well, it is unless it's an elementary school and we just said no volunteers. And I, we could ask Sean if that's something that would work well or not, but uh, I don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you had a well I, it, so forgive me for this. Um, it's more thinking out loud, and I apologize for bringing it up. But um, seeing sort of the reaction of my Dartmouth students and my own teenager at home to masks again, um, I'm sort of anticipating a point where 
the high schoolers kind of go, enough, we're vaccinated, we've done what you asked us to do, we want to take our masks off, you know, this is, so I, I guess I'm just sort of wondering um, if there is a mechanism or a time, and, and it's not now given Delta and everything, but um, if that's part of the conversation with the town of Hanover, with um, the, within the committee about, you know, disaggregating the populations. Mm -hmm. And if there's a point at which within your classroom where we can identify close contacts, you are allowed to take off your mask to learn. And then in the hallways, you'd have to put it back on, or I don't know, like I, I'm just thinking out yes. loud, but. Yeah, um, and definitely, I mean, I, I feel like this will evolve as we move forward, mm -hmm. like last year too. And that's why we've set the parameters in place for you know, the vaccination status for infection rates um, and mm -hmm. all of those pieces. So right. I do feel like we have the ability to evolve as things change mm -hmm. around us. And mm -hmm. I feel like we did that last year too. Of course, you guys did a phenomenal job. So yeah. it's just taking all that information and, you know, trying to make the best decisions that we can with it. So for I sure. don't think that will necessarily it means that we're going to stick with this for the entire year. That's mm -hmm. why initially we said, you know, we look at it after the first two weeks too. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Garrett, you have a question? Yeah, but how do you guys think about just, you know, so obviously Tom raised the point about the domestic travel quarantine, yeah. but then I think the bigger thing is, is how are you guys thinking about it's okay to say, okay, let, you know, the high school has reached 80% vaccination rate, so let's just get rid of all the masks. But then you've got a high school student, at least in our family, who then has two siblings that are unvaccinated. So mm -hmm. that actually is like the biggest, that's why at least our family right now is actually masking a lot when we go places, because it's the two little ones that, and not little, I mean, they're both elementary schoolers, but they probably are now at the highest risk, which is completely upside down from where right. we were last year as far as risk factors, right? That mm -hmm. There's more of the older population that we're worried about. And the younger kids, like, yeah, they'll, you know, they'll be fine. But now it's like, so how, how does that go into the planning as far as like, you know, because unfortunately, that's kind of a big deal when our middle schooler might just be like, right. pass off, we're all free now. But yet, then he comes home infected, he may be fine. But the two little ones now are like, Right. Now that is, shape. I mean, that's a big concern and that's something that we've talked about. Yeah. Whether we maintain, you know, separate policies for different schools, depending upon vaccination rates and things like that. So right. for sure, that that's definitely an issue. And then also, I mean, this kind of goes with the research that we've been talking about too, that you know, if you look at the research that's just come out recently with the high numbers of school data that have been examined, masking is, it helps tremendously mm -hmm. from preventing the spread regardless of vaccination status. So, you know, we feel like that's the one mitigation effort. Mm -hmm. If we have it in place that regardless of whether it's a vaccinated or not vaccinated, okay. That's helping. That's good to hear. And I think that's why I keep hearing, at least right. from my, mm -hmm. you know, town's neighbors and stuff, is that mm -hmm. releasing everything else and outside and all that, and even the potting, I'll let that all go, but the masks right. are like. Well, like even, the, you know, for evil. example, the quarantining and the um, contact tracing, we won't be doing contact tracing in the schools next year because, again, research shows us that there were not high numbers of kids across the country that became infected in schools that did have masking in place. Right. So it was a really rare occurrence. So we were doing all this contact tracing, but in fact, we were not finding the spread in the schools that was happening outside of the schools. And generally when students were not masked. So, you know, it's something that supports us returning to school with masks on at least initially too. So it sounds like, sorry to keep going. So it sounds like this plan is kind of built around masking. And if we suddenly start dropping the masking, then there's going to be some bigger decisions that have to be made. Yeah. Yes. And like I said, none of these decisions are easy to yeah. be made. You know, we have struggled and we have varying opinions on the committee too. So, which is nice because, you know, someone will say something, you know, counter to what a majority of the committee is saying, I think people are comfortable expressing 
um, their opinions, regardless of whether they're in sync with one another or, and it, I think it's brought us to some good conclusions. Too. Yeah. So, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the different, we might have different policies for the different schools based upon their ages and the vaccination rates. But one thing I remember from the last meeting that Julie Stevenson was very clear about is that whatever happens with, within a school needs to be exactly the same. And I just wondered if that was still what you were hearing, because I, I guess I'm a little leery about having a policy for vaccinated kids and a policy for unvaccinated kids. That feels, yeah. I, I don't, I, I mean, on one hand, I can argue that I can argue it both ways, but it just feels, I, I, Julie was very clear that that would not happen at the high school, that there would be a problem, you know, as far as she was concerned, it needed to be all or nothing um, for everyone. And I just wondered if you were still having those sorts of conversations. I think if we get to the point that we are starting to talk about different um, policies for different schools, then yes, okay. you know, that will definitely come up again. And then my second question is, I sort of feel like the first two weeks of school are crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm not sure I'm comfortable having a discussion about taking masks off after only two weeks based mm -hmm. upon everything else you all are gonna be doing. So I just wondered what had been discussed, like if you needed more time, mm -hmm. I, Kelly's shaking her head, but- It's not gonna happen then. Yeah. <laughs> so. Really old mandate, right? Okay. I I well, that, I guess that affects us too, because it's just we kids under initially, okay. because you know, we were thinking, okay, well, at that point, the numbers here okay. were not right. significant okay. at all. And so, but now, two weeks later, after our initial right. meeting, things are changing. And right. so we thought, okay, well, we can see if it does have an impact once we get back to school and if we're seeing increasing okay. numbers and things like that. And part of returns okay. to its session. And so I think realistically at this point, given the town of Hanover's requirements, right. given what the state of Vermont has said, we have schools, two elementary schools where kids are not gonna be vaccinated. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess I would just argue, we need to say that out loud because people are people are talking about it's only two weeks. Yeah. And I just am yeah. sort of like, no, it, it's two weeks and then it might be more. Right. So um, that, that doesn't, that part of the message seems to have been missed by some people, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, and the Kelly's candid point, we just need to drop them entirely. It should not say on their two weeks, it should say until further notice. Because mm -hmm. the yeah. literalists are gonna be like, oh good, that means two weeks. And okay. then they'll be horribly disappointed when we know it's not gonna happen. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And teenagers are literalists. Yes, yes, they <laughs> yes. yes, they are. And Tom, do you have a question? I don't have a question. I just wanted to, I wanna apologize if I came off as criticizing you really oh, directly, no. that was not the point. <laughs> No, I, it was so more just fun. trying to sort through what guidance we're getting and what yeah, legal you know, uh, requirements we are bound by. So that was not the, the intention there. So. No, I know. You know Jamie, we had a question from before. I have a question. I just want to make sure that, and I, I am just re, you know, restating this for the all of the Dresden and SAU board members, if you weren't privy to the fact that in the state of New Hampshire, the governor signed a bill where you cannot require public schools. Right. Right. So you all hence know my, that. Hence my apologies. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, I just some people don't realize that, and they're they're you know taken aback that we can't mandate that everybody get a vaccine who's right. an employee, right? And and so there's only a very few things in that are New Hampshire public where they can require it, and they're mostly in medical facilities, not schools, not colleges, not DPWs or towns or... Thank you. Yes, Ben. So to that point, in the, the visitors and volunteers section, the mm -hmm. last sentence says visitors should follow school mask protocols. We can't say they will follow school mask protocols. We can shall. Mm -hmm. Can we yeah, toughen that up? <laughs> yeah. Any other points for relevant questions? Moving on to... Superintendent's report, Jay. Great, thanks. Uh, I know we're digging into the uh, <clears throat> Forward School Board's time here a little bit. So um, I just want to add to what Robin just shared. Uh, in addition to the good and important work that she and the committee are engaged in, preparation for the new school year is well underway, as you can see in the hallways. Um, our custodial maintenance staff are hard at work getting, getting all our buildings ready. Our IT folks are ramping up and, and uh, testing out uh, new equipment and so forth. HR scrambling to onboard new hires, um, which is, of course, the purpose for all these special meetings. 
and uh, Jamie and her team are already gearing up for the next budget season. So it's a, it's a busy, busy time now all of a sudden. Um, our building administrators are likewise uh, working with their staff to, to get ready as well. And we've got a lot of teachers. I've seen quite a few teachers in and out. I know Rob has been busy working on uh, curriculum projects with them. Uh, counselors are getting to work on all the sort of schedule changes and all the last minute work that they do. And then on top of that, we've got our major initiatives that, that again, we're sort of back burner during the month of July, but uh, we'll be getting back at, on the strategic plan. Uh, it's time to resume and get the, the uh, you'll, you'll be reaching, uh, Brian will be reaching out to board members on uh, uh, the um, convene that committee again. Um, the evaluation committee is ready, is set to complete its work. And the next step will be to make formal recommendations to the board and the HEA, and then to devise an implementation schedule. So um, should the board agree to the changes that have been um, farmed out and sort of shopped around for feedback, uh, we'd be looking at some sort of a pilot uh, group this, this initial year, and then be ready to go uh, wheels up come um, the, the next school year with a new, the totally new system. Already, we've, we've, um, we have a, a, a test uh, case going on right now at Marion Cross, even though they're not part of that committee, other than uh, Sean does join us for some of those meetings. They've already moved to the Danielson framework for the underlying basis for the evaluation model. They've already engaged in some pretty substantial professional development with a focus on equity. And, um, and, and that professional development has been provided by a trainer from the Vermont NEA who has a counterpart in New Hampshire. And I've already had conversation with uh, the acting head of our, our HEA uh, group here about sort of mirroring, mirroring and replicating the training that's been happening at, at Marion Cross. Uh, both Robin and I were able to join Sean for some of those sessions and thought it was really high quality. So we're excited about that. Um, the, uh, aside from that, um, there's, there are lots of other professional development needs that arise from that because many of our staff, we've been working with what we call the SAU 70 standards of best practice as the basis for our evaluation supervision system. And so there are many folks who are familiar with Danielson because it's used almost everywhere else. Um, and, uh, we, but it will require that we do some professional development on just that, just the framework for, uh, for teaching. And um, so, so that's something that we'll be, we're looking at uh, devoting our October in-service work and some more longstanding sessions to be able to provide that that training for folks. So we should be able to get all that done and really have people up to speed in a way that everyone can handle the new information. And so when we go fully live this the following year, um, we'll, we'll have our training taken care of. So I'm excited about that. That's gonna, I think, a, gonna be a, an important change for us. Um, aside from that, I've had a really, it's, it, there's been a lot of folks that we've brought on. Um, Sean's doing his part to make sure that we, we bring in fresh new ideas to the school system. And I've had a chance to interview all these candidates and I'm really excited we're bringing in some, some folks from different places with different, different points of view, different, um, different backgrounds and a lot of added value, a lot of experiences that I think will make, uh, make for a really rich staff that'll have other things to share with students that make learning relevant. So great job for all of our principals that are doing a great job hiring, so. That's my update for now. Uh, and we'll send a formal one to the community. I sent a little sort of a teaser out last, last week and uh, Robin and I are working on a more comprehensive message to go out to everyone, staff and, and families uh, about two weeks out from the start of school. Well, actually about a week and a few days out from the start of school. Any questions for Jay? Yes, Kim. Um, I think I missed it, <laughs> but can you maybe, quickly repeat the strategic planning update. I, I missed that one. It was a brief mention that we're, we're going to restart. So we, we haven't met through the month of July. We had our last meeting was with four chairs and a, a couple of the other uh, volunteers that we've had from the board who are interested in working on this. And so Ryan's going to be reaching out to schedule the next meeting. Can you remind me who those four board members are? Each of the chairs and then let me look. That's a yeah. Okay. All right. I I just a couple of the folks that joined us. Not from the board. But there Lisa, were others. weren't you weren't you there at that last meeting? 
No? Okay. No, because I didn't know anything about we were. Okay. So, asked so right now it's the four chairs. <laughs> I'd be happy to help, but <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. So. Any other questions? Um, are we clear with that answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. And with James, we would love to hear from you. So I'm sure you've had your screens up for boy dogs for mm -hmm. longer than when I've just posted the new end of year projection as I was working on it while we were sitting here. Um, so if you want to refresh, I've posted. Um, a financial projection, uh, which is better than the one you saw in May for the SAU uh, 70 budget wrap up. We had promised um, $78,554 to go into the 21 22 budget year and we'll actually be carrying, this is unaudited, um, approximately $156,000 in, in surplus. Um, most of that was off of operations. Um, the bulk of that was in salaries. You know, we had some folks who left us um, mid-year and, you know, we had some difficulty in filling a few of the positions, getting the right fit. So it provided us with some savings in the salary line predominantly. Um, so that's good news as we go and we start to build the next one forward. Uh, we'll be able to use some of that surplus as an offset. I will also apologize um, that I had thought we had pulled in the non-public session section, 7B. I thought we had pulled that off. So I would ask the chair to uh, disregard that for tonight, specifically because we are going to be um, rediscussing the administration salary compensation committee and all of that. So that'll come back as a part of that. So please disregard that section. Have we done? <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? No, Thank you, Jamie. Any questions? Um, then I would uh, love a motion to move it around. Well, we don't have to. She just took an option. Is there anything that we're talking about non public? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Move to enter into non public session under RSA 91 A colon 3 to personnel. Thank you. Is there a second? Think so. And all in favor? Uh, that needs to be a roll call vote. Roll call from our that's right. Thank you. Uh, Kim. Hartman, yes. Holly. McCarl, yes. Christy, yes. Mm -hmm. Bless, yes. Percy, yes. Johnson, yes. Tom, yes. Danny, yes. No doubt yet. Thank you. We did come in there. We did. Yeah. Okay. Um, agenda topics for next meeting. If anyone has anything, please let me know. Um, our next meeting will be on the 26th of October, 6 o'clock. Any motions to adjourn? Kim. Move to adjourn at 8.04 p.m. Thank you. Second by Kelly. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, guys, stay for the